Get your little noises there, Chris. Bring us in. And we're recording. Hi, yeah. Hannah. How we doing? Good. So um, you are probably our most high-profile guest so far. Uh, I'll go around the table and introduce everyone because I've never met you except emailing and tweeting at you. Um, our friend John Losey, at Lax Losey on Twitter. He is a uh, budding um, producer, commentator. Whenever there's a lacrosse game in the area and we can get it streamed in a camera on it, whether it's for UDM or Hill versus Culver, our friend John hops in the booth and makes it happen. I don't know if you know Chris Colin. Never, no, no of, but never, never met. Okay. Well, I think we know of. Gotcha. Minimal communication. Gotcha. Uh, and then my name's Chris Druin. I'm a local official, coach, daddy, former player, whatever. And I got voted the president of the U.S. Lacrosse Michigan chapter back in January. And then our season got canceled. And so if we don't have games to coach or play or ref, we said let's talk about lacrosse. So we started this sure. podcast under the guise of U.S. Lacrosse Michigan or under the banner of U.S. Lacrosse Michigan. And we've been talking to – Men's coaches, women's coaches, high school, college, NAIA, MCLA, NCA Division Three, NCA Division One, you name it. So, yeah, why not? Let's have some fun with it. So, what I figured we'd do is we'd go after some of the high-profile people, and the fact that we have a Australian national team player, a multiple-time NCAA winning champion, a Division One coach, a Tawartan winner, 45 minutes from us, let's have Hannah on and see if she wants to talk lacrosse. So, welcome. Golf clap. Thanks very much. Golf happy clap. to do it. Golf Always clap. happy to talk lacrosse. <laughs> So we don't have a formal agenda on this. We don't have a list of questions. There's no speed round. There are no specific topics. We just kind of talk for about an hour and see where the conversation takes us. Too easy. Love it. Perfect. It is. It, it's a free-flowing, fun-loving couple <laughs> of guys. That's it. So I guess I'll start with a couple of questions. How are your girls doing without a season? How are your seniors doing? Uh, how is – how is the culture, how is the attitude, how is the mental health of Michigan women's lacrosse? Yeah, look, I think in the initial, um, it was, you know, and, and still is t tough, obviously, that, that day that we had to tell them, and then the initial shock, and the, just the anger, and the frustration, and especially with how well we were doing, you know, we, we had a loss early in the season, and we really recovered really really well from it and we're starting to hit our stride so I think just just from the seniors point of view there's the loss and the sadness and, and just the underclassmen freshmen don't really understand it and then the in-betweeners uh just um it was really hard you know coaches as well uh, and I think as it's gone on it's just you know there's been acceptance I think obviously the the landscape of the world right now it's um what we're going through is just a, a small part but um yeah, they're, they're, they're doing, you know, well. They're currently in final exams with Michigan ending so early. So they're about to finish school, which can be, which I think is going to be another challenge for them. You know, they've had their classes to keep them pretty regimented up until mm -hmm. this point. And now a lot of them are finishing. And um, from my understanding, they're, they're itching to get back to Ann Harbor. They're ready to get out of their parents' houses. And, um, you know, we've been doing a good job of staying in touch with them. This, this last week we've been doing positional meetings, which have just been, fun trivia family feud just kind of trying to get back that the things that we miss the most which is just like the laughing and the relationship mm -hmm. side of it um you know l very little x's and o's lacrosse type stuff uh since the season got canceled more just keeping in touch and keeping a pulse on how everyone's doing gotcha um within some of the the, the next steps have you started having interviews with your seniors to just see if they're going to be transferring if they're going to try for another uh, I know it's sensitive, and I know that you don't want to name specific names, but I just how, – how are those conversations going if you had them? Yeah, we had those pretty early on, um, actually, you know, maybe a week, you know, a weekend. I just sort of said, hey, guys, I know it's very, very early, but give me a sense of what you're thinking. And there was a handful that were interested. Uh, obviously, at that point, we didn't know what Michigan was doing in terms of honoring their scholarship or, um, or not. Um, and as it turns out, majority of them are going to be moving on uh, we already had one that was planning on coming back because of an injury and then um three more they're going to be coming back so so in total we've got four out of about 10 that um 
that are going to come back for a fifth year. Okay. Um, and then has, I know most of the recruits signed a letter of intent, so they don't really have any flexibility, but have they been communicating with you about what's next and, and, and what, to, yeah. what they can expect? Yeah. And that's, that's again, something that I wanted to tackle pretty early as well. Just in, um, as soon as that kind of ruling came out, there was a, a bit of a frenzy from, from a lot of high school players. Um, so contacting that our, our incoming class was something of high priority to me. And uh, we, you know, we just assured them we have a really good class coming in and we're, we've been excited about them for a long time. Um, and I just reassured them. I'm like, look, you know, we could have girls coming back, but you can either look at it, you know, as a negative and, you know, uh, I don't know if I can swear. Um, oh, oh no, my, my spot might be in jeopardy. Um, or you can, you know, attack it with excitement and, and think of it as an opportunity to get to play with players that you thought were going to be graduating, who are some of the best players on our team. And uh, they were really excited about it. So we obviously honored all those. And, and even the following class, you know, I made sure to contact them and just say, look, we, we honor our commitment to you. And, uh, you know, so far it's been a really good response from, from both classes. So I didn't say it. We, we normally have to say it to the old grizzled refs and coaches of the game. We try not to swear on this. So thank you. For I'm Australian, so it's, it's, it's really hard for me. It happens. It happens. He's got a little, he's got a little bleep button or something. He can bleep it out, right? Yeah, he's got it. We we had a long time Hall of Fame official on, and I spent so much time editing his swear words out that I screwed up the intro. But oh you know, th this is under the banner of U.S. Lacrosse's Michigan chapter, so we have seventy five hundred members, Sorry. kids, coaches, parents. We try to behave, but we'll figure it out. Don't don't think I'm scolding you. Um, I'll be on my best behavior. So I I want to kind of ask you because we've had this conversation with Chris Cole and and uh, Michael. Um, Oh, God, I always mess up pronouncing his name. The, the head coach at Hope, um, Shellhouse, uh, how is recruiting going to be different for these next few classes as far as events, as far as film, as far as um, prospect days? Have you put much thought into that yet? <laughs> I feel like it's all I'm thinking about. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, look, with the 2022s, it's just a lot of unknown right now. You know, we, um, the governing body of women's lacrosse just made a big decision to cancel all of their tournaments for the summer and, and their big one that they host in November down in Florida. So that was a big, a big thing of I'm trying to think last week or the week before. Uh, a lot of the tournaments in June have been bumped to July and then even some of the July ones have been bumped to August, which is still currently a dead period. Um, so it's just really, really, unknown for us uh as to how it's going you know we're relying on a lot of film we, we had a pretty big list um, of 2022s coming out of our fall tournaments but you know we learned in the last recruiting cycle so much changes between you know november and then the following june when you see these girls again with, with developmental and, and all of that so uh, it's gonna look different and, and i don't know even with traveling and what the university of michigan allows us to do in terms of recruiting and you know, once September 1 happens, is it going to be virtual visits and, and uh, how, how is that going to look? And just today I was talking to one of my assistants about coming up with a virtual tour of campus and, and coming up with, you know, online platforms for recruiting visits if, if that's what it comes down to in September. Uh, so we're trying to plan, uh, you know, but it's really, really, we're finding it's really difficult not knowing, you know, day yeah. by day we're learning more information, we're getting pushed pushed further and further down the road. And what have you heard from the administration? I mean, from a, from a school perspective, I mean, there's been, you know, a lot of schools coming out saying, we don't know, some people pushing hard to do it, being cutting edge. What, what's been the message from the administration? Yeah, it's, it, we had, a, we had a, these long head coaches calls, you know, once every couple of weeks, we had just had another one today. And, and it's, you know, they're, they're just trying to really do, take their due diligence and do things the right way and not rush back into anything. I think right. that's, obviously how the country and the different states are trying to approach it as well and, and not just try and get kids back on campus and get coaches back on campus. Uh, you know, where there's a dead period until the end of May. And then once that opens up, uh, you know, I, I know Ward has said, you know, we, we want you to recruit, we want you to be able to travel, but at the same time, your safety is, is paramount and the top priority. So whether it's just recruiting locally and driving places, might be something that we're we're forced to do and so maybe it's basing myself on the east coast for the summer 
uh, and, and Trish trying to get to smaller events, uh, mm. you know, could be something, certainly something I've thought about uh, and trying to run little clinics, you know, when things somewhat ease up, you know, trying to come up with a, with a plan to, to run some smaller events up and down the East coast. Uh, but it's, just again, so much unknown. It's it's hard to plan, you know. Yeah, you really can. I mean, the same thing here in the state of Michigan. I, I do uh, scheduling for Brother Rice, the boys' team, yep. and obviously with that season being canceled, and now the MHSA came out and said, and this is for the girls as well, that you know, come June first, um, you know, schools are able to play as a school from June first uh, until right. August first, fifteen games, and so I'm I'm trying to put together things. I built out this whole schedule, and that's good. And then yeah, I mean. You know, I've gone down like three paths throughout this entire process and all of them and landed at a dead end. So I'm hoping that eventually, if I just keep doing it, yeah. something's going to break. I know. It's like plan, plan B, plan C, plan done. A. Done. Done um, and done. I'm at least, you know, hoping that at some point, you know, a club team from Philly might be able to scrimmage a club team from Maryland and, and you know, I can go watch or at least get it videoed. Uh, I'm actually on the East Coast at the moment, just, just staying out with some friends um, and have been during this, this whole thing and she's a club coach and, and we've just been kind of brainstorming back and forth of what might be a possibility. And again, it's very hard to know when, uh, when all these restrictions are still in place, but maybe yeah. a few weeks time when, when they start to lift, there may be some sense of, all right, you can play a game, but no one can watch or, or whatever it is. Well, you know, we, we have a lot of friends in the game around us. And um, we've got a great guest topic here is getting Brian Kaminskis who uh, runs the Lax Bash events. Uh, so he's got Boobash and Lax Bash and the Windy City and, and all these tournaments, whether they're in season for youth or summer events. Um, you know, I had a call with Brian Kaminskis the other day, and he's trying to figure out, okay, if we do have an event, are we limited on spectators? Do we have to tell every team they can only have 15 parents? No grandparents, no siblings. Right. Not every kid gets a, t you know. Um, do trainers have to wipe down golf carts with Clorox wipes? after every run for an injury you know like these are the questions that he's asking that i'm going you know as a ref i'm going how am i going to blow a whistle if i gotta wear a face mask how am i going to breathe yeah. sucking air up yeah. the good thing though coaches <laughs> six feet can't scream in my ear when i'm sweeping the box so there's some positives <laughs> in it um exactly. but even though we're trying to plan we don't know what that planning entails and i, I know that's going to make it different for difficult for everybody but I, I, I've been very impressed that everybody that I've talked to is trying to say the right things with being positive, that we're going to try to make it work yeah. without being yep. doom and gloom or without being, you guys are, are ruining everyone's day or getting their hopes up. I, it's such an uncertain right. thing that I think it's been really positive that we're all been trying to brainstorm and find solutions. Absolutely. Well, I think people, you know, everyone's in the same boat. Kids want to play the, you know, parents want to play, coaches want to coach. I mean, coaches want to recruit, you know, it's, um, it's, we, we want to get back to work. And, uh, you know, I think that it's going to be smaller, you know, smaller type events or, you know, as I said, maybe a couple teams getting together and, and playing just a solo game, you know, a couple nights a week or whatever it is. I, I don't know that these big events are going to happen for, for some of the reasons that you said, um, but perhaps smaller type things and, and more, maybe more like the high school games, you know, whatever yeah. it is, maybe high schoolers will want to play one last game as a senior class and, and get some games. In. So hopeful down the road that, I mean, you know, sports can resume not only for the recruiting part, but for these kids to get their kind of sanity back. Yeah. I, and, and I, yeah, one of the things that, yeah, when I, when I built this thing out, I mean, I, I, Chris Colin, he, he's seen what I built out and it was, you know, very detailed talking about, um, you know, screening the night before. There's a lot of technology out there in terms of, uh, you know, you do a self-screen the night before, uh, taking, uh, you know, uh, players' temperatures, uh, you know, as they enter the event, um, you know, the spacing. And so, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting and it's really going to be, you know, the creativity and the proactive thinking that's going to, you know, it's, it, it's something's going to happen, right? I mean, you look at July and August and, you know, the, the biggest question is going to be the social gathering piece, right? How many, how many people in the same place at the same time is going to be the big piece? And then from there, um, you know, how do you do it? How do you do it safely? How do you make the, the players and, and the parents? I mean, that's my thing, right? I've got, I've got a young daughter who's, who's going to be a freshman at Mercy. And I'm like, all right, I, wanna, I want her to go out east and do the things that we had planned. But, right. you know, what, what, what do you do? How do you be safe? 
got to try and do something. Yeah, I mean, I you think about some of those tournaments and hotels and flights and all of it. It's just you know, you, the more you think about it, you're like, eh, hang on a sec, this, <laughs> not sure this is gonna this is gonna look like a typical summer. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, my 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 uncle passed away this weekend, and uh, his funeral was today. And oh, wow. my dad's the only one that got to go up from our side of the family because once you put in uh, my aunt, the priest, his kids, and his grandkids, they had room for one person left. So my dad got to go wow. bury his brother, and we got to wish our cousins we love you on Facebook. Uh, it's goofy right now. I mean, I, I don't say that from a point of give me sympathy. I say it from a point of – you know, talking to my dad today as he's driving back from Lansing and, you know, checking on his mental health, worrying about yeah. a lacrosse game in July, I felt a little like, well, yeah, we'll, we'll go get to that stuff in a little bit. You know, like I've been asked about recruiting a lot, and I think at the end of the day, it's, we're not out of the woods yet, you know, with this whole thing, and it's, it's almost like these kids are being like, what can we do to show you? And it's like, part of my answer is like, just be safe, like, you know, yeah. stay, work out, and, and obviously stay fit, and, and do all that, but you'll get recruited, you know, as it, it, if typically 2022s would get recruited this through the summer and committed through the fall, but it's just going to be later. And I think uh, it's something that, you know, the people who stress about it, the coaches included will make some rush decisions. And so will the kids, and I think it's, we just need to be prepared to push everything back and get through this next few month period safely and healthily. And, um, you know, recruiting can wait. <laughs> Yeah. So, so let me use that as a transition away from some of the COVID talk. And again, it, it's what's topical, so yeah. we're not going to avoid it. Um, no. but, but I did want to ask you a question about your roster and recruiting in particular. Um, yep. I do not do anything on here as a gotcha kind of thing or, or anything like that. Um, but as this is the Michigan Lacrosse Chapter podcast, you only have one player from Michigan on your roster. Um, if you want to say Druin – don't ask me that. Cut this out of the podcast. I will totally respect that. I'm, I'm not here to try to pick fights or anything like that. But as a guy that's trying yeah. to grow the game in Michigan, our premier I'm women's program here. has one kid. So yeah. is it – Second year. I'm a defender. She's in her second year. Oh, She's got time. She's got to go recruit girls. Hit the boo button. Yes, I was Hit just the about to button, say, you know, if I had it my way, there's a, there's a Michigander about four hours down the road at Northwestern that I would love to be on my team. Um, <laughs> Izzy Snake. Yeah, we, we know her. I wasn't at Northwest. I was not sorry, Michigan when uh, when that was being recruited. But no, the one Michigan kid we have is awesome, Maggie Kane, one of our best players. Um, we do have a Michigan player coming in uh, twenty. Jillian. 20, uh, Jillian. So, um, so Jillian Smith. We're keeping him in. You know, we're trying, we're doing our best to try and keep the best kids in Michigan. And, uh, you know, when I see these great Michigan athletes going to places like North Carolina or Northwestern, uh, it certainly doesn't sit well with me. But, um, you know, now that we're, you know, me and my staff are, are in town, it's definitely one of our recruiting keys is like, let's find the best kid in the state and, and keep him in Michigan. Every year. Uh, Yep. So we're, we're definitely trying to do that. And I think, you know, the nature of the beast too is that Michigan, it's still growing. The game's still growing. I'd love to have more in-state girls and, and uh, it's certainly improving. Um, but, you know, there is a little bit more talent. The level out east is still a little bit higher, generally speaking. Uh, but, but of course, I, I'm with you. I want more Michigan girls on the roster as well. And, and I, I didn't mean to, to, you know, pick a fight with that or whatever, but, you know, again, I'm, oh. I'm the guy that's trying to grow the game here in Michigan. Um, within some of that, we have asked pretty much everybody involved with the women's game in Michigan, with soccer being in the same season as lacrosse, do you think that's hurting the development of the girls, of the game, of the numbers? I think it plays a part for sure. You know, the states that, that it's uh, the soccer's in the fall, I uh, you naturally, soccer players make great lacrosse players. Uh, it's they're, they're athletes. Uh, they've usually they've got some hand-eye coordination, whatever it, whatever it may be. But I found that in, uh, I lived in California for a while, and that was a big part of of um, obviously soccer in California is massive. And I thought it was a real big played a big part in those girls not playing lacrosse. So I think it uh, it certainly hurts, but I do think it's growing, and that's you know part of what we're trying to do as Michigan kind of lacrosse. We make our presence known you know nationally on the national landscape you know it's it's our hope that we can continue to grow the game in state and uh you know certainly over the next year if if 
recruiting and, and running camps locally is all we can do. It's a great opportunity for us to continue to build uh, and grow the game. And I think we've, we've done a decent job at it uh, over the last kind of two and a half years that I've been here uh, with, with the camps and clinics and such. So we, we hope to continue to see it, to see it grow for sure. Yeah, you make a good point. You make a good point in, in terms of an opportunity this year with the way the landscape's going to be, where you know parents are probably not going to want to travel, right? And and the, there's a difference between driving an hour up to Ann Arbor and uh, you know and, and and putting their daughter in a you know three day camp or whatever it may be, uh, right. jumping on a plane and going out east for a week and a half. Yeah, exactly, and it's and it gives us a good opportunity. You know, if we have to be, you know. It's, stuck not traveling you know then why not let's just uh if we can run some events locally then you know i, I know any opportunity we can get out on the field you know me and my staff will love to do it so it's certainly be something that we're hoping to do as as things ease up awesome no Very thank positive. you for the, the honest answer i wasn't trying to pick on you i think i've apologized three times now oh, no. but i ask um Stop apologizing. okay uh so with you now being in ann arbor uh, Chris, do you have a list of food questions about Ann Arbor you're waiting to, to ask her? No, no. Uh, my I have um, my questions are Australia based. So. Oh, yeah. Love it. Yeah, I I was waiting for Callum. I you know I know he's back in Australia, so yes. I know the time difference is all screwy. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to get some inside uh, oh, info oh, on you from God. him. I'm scared. If you ask him, I'm sure he's got it. So, at, least, <laughs> at least you didn't wait to the last minute, Chris. Hopefully he doesn't throw you <laughs> the bus too badly. No, nah, so he didn't get back to me yet, but um, my That's question is, bad. first question is, uh, you know, um, you know, have you been back since the fires and everything? Have you, have you talked to your family? How's that affected your kind of, your situation here being so far away? Um, yeah, you know what? I was um I was home over Christmas for about four weeks, and uh, oh, that's great. when yeah, so that's when they were really bad. Uh, obviously, and I remember coming back, came back like the first week of January, and and they were again kind of hitting their peak, and uh, it was horrible. You know, it was horrible. Usually, for a lot of the Australian, um, you know, does disasters or or things that go on, I'm not home to see it. I usually am seeing it from afar, uh, but to be home on the ground while that was going on was just just devastating uh it was you know pretty close to home for me no one, none of my family were directly impacted but just you know australia is a small community big big in size but very right. um right. tight-knit community lots of small country towns still and that was just devastating to to see and uh you know right before this you know COVID 19 really took our season away uh we were we were meant to play cincinnati on a friday and then we we're meant to play home against Denver on Sunday and that was meant to be a um like a bushfire awareness game oh. uh, we had a video we had a fundraising thing going on and we never got to do it which was unfortunate but uh yeah something that was you know close to my heart and and uh tough to be home for give me two things that Australians do better than Americans relax um <laughs> and <laughs> oh man um <laughs> Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say like relax and disconnect is probably one. I know how Callum would answer, and he probably wouldn't be appropriate. I was gonna say, yeah, Not for this show. Only, I was gonna say put back some drinks, but <laughs> again, I don't know how. Drink fosters, maybe drinking fosters, and a few too many of them, maybe. <laughs> um. Who are your top uh, two kind of uh, role models in sports? Because I think, you know, I, Australia has just so many. Well, give me three. How about your top three um, coming out of Australia or anywhere in the world? Um, yeah, but your top I, three, yeah. Love, um, Aussies love their sport. Um, you know, some, some of these you may not know, but, but growing up, um, Justin Langer is an Australian cricketer that I just absolutely – just loved as a kid. Um, I big tennis fan, and, and Roger Federer. Even though you know it's not Australian, but tennis is has a very big culture back home. And growing up, going to the Australian Open, Roger mm -hmm. Federer was somebody that I um, just just idolized. And Michael Jordan, actually, um, which again, not we Australian, like but Jordan. not maybe not. Um, he's right here. I got him right here. Uh, yeah. So watching the the MJ series right now has been incredible. Uh, you know, reminds me of my childhood growing up and trying to emulate him in the backyard. But uh, like basketball, basketball is not my specialty. 
Um, but no, sports in general. And then there's a lot of like Aussie footballers that again, uh, wouldn't Americans wouldn't know too much, but Aussie rules football was something that I grew up uh, playing and watching and uh, just idolized some of those players. And uh, weirdly, playing all those different sports growing up too, I think has helped me be a better lacrosse player. So. Cool. If you had to stop playing lacrosse, which one would you play? Ooh. <laughs> tennis. You pretty good at tennis? Yeah, I grew up playing tennis. I love it. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to have to uh, – I only play for money. So. Well, yeah. and we got and they added a list because I thought we were trying to get that uh, U.S. lacrosse oh. Michigan podcast tournament uh, set up. Let's go. You – I play for hundred bucks a hundred bucks a game, so let's go. We got, we got Cosgrove. We got uh, we okay. Got hold on, hold on. Time out. If Rick Neuheisel got fired from uh, Washington for being in an NCAA basketball tournament pool, are two Division One coaches <laughs> betting on tennis going to get you guys in trouble? Oh, we're going to play a friendly, a friendly match. We're we'll going to play a friendly. It's just okay. a friendly. <laughs> Hey, listen, we're trying to get views any way we can, so let them go ahead with it, Drew. Yeah. I mean, that might really be beneficial for us. That's the press patch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to keep going with some of Colin's questions on, on sports. Um, you know, we've all grown up in the Detroit area, grown up in Michigan, with the University of Michigan being big house football on Saturdays and, you know, them putting football out there as bigger than life. It's not like you got off the plane and Ann Arbor was your first destination. But, you know, Northwestern hockey isn't a big thing. Northwestern football isn't, you know, Michigan football. Cooler stadium, in my opinion. Better place to tailgate. But how is it with your culture fitting in with women's lacrosse at a big-time Big Ten university like that? Has it been a a transition for you? Or is it just like, eh, I was played at Northwestern. This is easy. Um. It's actually, it's been, uh, I, look, the difference between Northwestern and Michigan is, is just crazy. Um, you know, s- s- I won't even say similar, just totally, just totally different. Obviously, yeah. at Northwestern, um, when I was there, football was, was okay. Um, as a lacrosse team, we were, you know, we were the team yeah. uh, in my time. But so it's been, you know, it's been interesting coming to a, but a place like Michigan where, yeah, yeah. I absolutely know that as a women's lacrosse program, we're down the totem pole a little bit. And that's, that's completely fine with me. They, at Michigan doesn't, they make you feel like you're equally as important. And what I think has been really fun for me at Michigan is how easy it's been to, I guess, like bleed maize and blue. Like you, you come in and there's just so much school spirit uh, and so Passion. much pride in Ann Arbor and so much pride with the people working in the department and, with the athletes and you can just sense it walking around campus, which I think is a little different to what I experienced at Northwestern. Um, I think maybe because of the success the football team has had and just the following and how big it is. And, and that's been something that I've really enjoyed uh, coming into. I, I did a very short stint right out of college at Penn state. And it was really similar yeah. uh, as a, you know, going from Northwestern and then as a 21 year old moving to state college and just being like, Whoa, these guys yeah. are like, crazy about Penn State and that's college time deal. so um yeah while we're you know maybe a, a lower tier sport I, it just it never feels like that we get obviously the facilities are second to none we get treated very very well and and uh you know I would say that my girls don't feel any you know lesser to, to the other athletes on campus okay cool. hey, can I go into my important the question this is similar oh. question did, did, this come, did this come in? Is this one just, are you reading this off your phone or is this, you had this one before? No, I had this. This is okay. the most important question to me uh, for the whole night. Um, with someone that's had just like such a, an amazing success and ride at Northwestern, right? Like, I, I mean, <coughs> you're the one of the best in the world, right? You're, uh, and and it, your experience at Northwestern was just outrageous, right? Like the, the best. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> and you are the best there. How crazy is it for you as a coach now to walk in and compete against them? What kind of feelings, and I, I'm talking feelings, how do you, because I, I mean, we all want to play our alma mater and we want to win and we want to do all that stuff, but I can't imagine uh, at your level of success then walking back into that environment and the, just the, the mixed emotion of feelings. Can you kind of go through that a little bit? Uh, 
because I, 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 you know, there's not so many people that have coached at such a high level and played at such a high level. Uh, to see those two things merge together uh, on a field must be just crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's always such a special thing to go back to Lakeside Field and, and get to play, you know, to, the challenge of, of going up against my coach, who's one of the best minds in the game. Uh, you know, is always a challenge, and and uh, she's she's a competitor. I'm a competitor, so there's been numerous times where she's absolutely crushed us and uh, doesn't take it easy on us, which is which is great. It's the way I want it. Um, but it is. I mean, I, we've actually never played. We were meant to play Northwestern at home for the first time this year, and then the season ended. But so we've never played them at home. So both all times we've we've been there, and and just walking on a lakeside field, it's just the memories come flushing back, and it's you know I remember winning different games on there and qualifying for the final four on that field. And, uh, you know, I think as you get older and you, you know, you lose a little bit more touch with the current players, you know, the, those feelings of being completely connected, you know, I'm, I'm all Michigan now. And so you get on the field and, and while there's a little bit of sentimental, you know, feelings there, once that was, you know, once the, the warm-ups start, you're like, all right, here we go. And, um, it's never fun to lose. I'm never happy when they beat us, you know, at all. Uh, but that being said, you know, last year Northwestern had an incredible run. They made it to the final four and, and I was, you know, sitting in the front row cheering them on. So it's, um, you know, when we're direct competitors, I think that there's somewhat some feelings, uh, uh, but, you know, you, you always want them to do well, but if we can be the team that beats them, then that's even better. Cool. Nice. And, and so... Go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, speaking of your team this year, you, you know, you guys get off to a good start, as you mentioned. Um, what were your expectations going into this season? Um, you know, if, I mean, did you have high hopes, um, you know, for this season? <laughs> yeah, I, I really did. You know, I, um, I said to the girls in our first team meeting that I fully thought we could make the Final Four this year. And uh -huh. uh, some of them looked at me with, you know, like, you're crazy. And there was one player on my team who was like, you know, let's absolutely let, let's do it. And um, I think, again, even when it ended, I, I do believe that we could, we could have got there. Um, we would just, again, we had a hiccup in game two against USC and really changed some things about our offense uh, after that game. And, and, you know, we went, we scored not, I think nine goals in game one, nine goals in game two, and then game three, four, five, it was 15, 20, 20, you know, 21 or something. And so we, we really figured out how to score goals and, and different players were stepping up each week. You know, we had different, this, this player scoring four, this player scoring three, this player scoring four the next game. And it was just, everyone was sharing a load of different players were stepping up. It was, it was just starting to get really fun and, and big tens were starting, you know, around the corner, which is just yeah. devastating to not get to see where you stack up. But I, yeah, that's, I think what made it really, you know, a hard pill to swallow is because sure. of how I thought we could do this year. And it wasn't just the on-field stuff. I think culturally we're in the best place we've ever been and leadership wise, we're in the best place we've ever been. And so just to have to end it, um, you, you go through such a long fall developing all that stuff and then, you know, it gets squashed and you have to think about doing it all again. But mm -hmm. I know the girls will be hungry next year and, and it's kind of like every team out there that they want, to go bigger and better, you know, the next time we're able to play. Yeah, we, we've talked about that often on this, just talking about, you know, the, the appreciation that I think everyone's going to have for, you know, not only the cross, but, you know, the, the simpler things that I think we took for granted. And so when you talk about the hunger for your girls, it's going to be, you know, open up a whole can uh, when, you're, when you're back in action and ready to roll. Um, quick question on, on recruiting, you know, historically Michigan always been, you know, you, Michigan sells itself. Um, and that was the big thing, uh, you know, for football and basketball, and Michigan sells itself. As it relates to women's lacrosse, how much of a factor, I mean, you know, Michigan's a you know, world organization school. Um, how much does that play into your recruiting? How much you utilize that? Um, can, can you speak to how Michigan as a whole helps you recruit? <laughs> yeah, you know, I was asked this question like a lot early on um, when I first took over the job and one thing I always used to say, which still, you know, holds true is it's fun to recruit to Michigan. You know, you don't have to try that hard um, because of the fact of what the block M stands for and, and how well recognized it is. Now, I think that's certainly true for 
you know, a, a large majority, but they're still in women's lacrosse. Uh, right. Players out there that maybe don't necessarily want, know what that's, that means and stands for, you know, people who have grown up maybe in Maryland and have, you know, just only been one track minded to the University of Maryland and then for women's lacrosse, they are the powerhouse. Right. Um, you know, you still got North Carolina to compete with and, um, but at least now we're in the conversation, you know, I've, I've other jobs I've had, it's been really difficult to just try and get them to <clears throat> look at you. Um, but at least now we pick up the phone and they're like, oh, wow, like, University of Michigan. And then it's now trying to, on top of that, now we've got the academics, we've got the, the school and the school spirit and the facilities and, and all of that. And now it's just really trying to sell, you know, what we can do lacrosse wise. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're now in the conversation, you know, as I said, like this, this re last recruiting cycle, um, you know, we, I was really, really happy with how we ended up, but we, we lost a few recruits, but now it's not like we're losing recruits to mid tier schools. It's like, Hey, yeah, yeah you're number two, but I want to go to Maryland or you're number two, but I want to go to North Carolina. Right. Um, so we're in the conversation of those top five schools, which I think um, it's just speaks volumes to, to the Michigan name and uh, how much weight that carries. Because um, yeah. as I said, yeah, you, you, you call them and, and if the kids don't know, you know what it stands for, the parents most likely do. Sure, yeah, yeah, and, and, and as, as you succeed and as you build the program and start winning, I mean, you, you put that combination, it's gonna be dangerous. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a dangerous combination uh, gonna be coming down the pipe for women's lacrosse. Right, and again, just another, another reason why it's disappointing about the season ending just again we were yeah, your high expectations yeah great things and and recruits would have paid attention but you know we'll just have to convince them convince them when we speak to them i guess yeah what would have happened exactly <laughs> so i i <laughs> this is gonna be an interesting question for me to ask in chris colin's presence um when when chris first got the 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 call to go coach in the pll you know, he, he asked a couple of his friends and I got one of those phone calls and goes, you know, what do you think? Should I go coach in the PLL? I think these are my pros and cons. And I said to Chris, if you can say to a recruit, I coached Paul Rabel and I see this in you, or, you know, it goes back to Mike Krzyzewski at Duke when he would be able to go into recruits Houskins and say, when I was coaching LeBron James this summer in the Olymp, you know, yeah. to have that ability to say that I coached this kid you're that kid. You know, you're the two-time Tawarton winner, the the World Cup, you know, all tournament team player. <laughs> Who do you, you when you go into a kid's house? Do you say, "I see a lot of Hannah Nielsen in you," or what do you say? <laughs> I see me. Oh man, I'm old though. They might not see. They might be like, "Who the heck? Who the heck? What do you look like when you play?" Um, no, I do. Pretty good. I, I, I on my own. Um, obviously my own experiences. I think I've still got that going for me. And I think, you know, my current players see that because I jump in at practice all the time. I'm still playing and I'm still playing World Cups. I'm still playing professionally. Um, and, you know, I would never used to say this, but I'm still playing pretty well. Like it's, um, so it's just, it's trying to relate to the kids that I'm current and that absolutely this is how, how I can help you get there. But no, I think there's certainly some other players that I, you know, can, can lean on to say you remind me of this person and uh um but no i think that's one a unique part you know there's not too many coaches left out there that are still playing uh and you know if i could be a professional lacrosse player i believe me i would yeah i hear you and, and i i know i kind of rambled on that but that was specifically a question i i said to chris i'm like can you imagine walking into a kid's house saying you know i coached coach paul rabel this summer and you remind yeah. me of, of x y or z <laughs> Because we've heard these stories. Um, I, I do want to get back to, to your playing career. Reading your bio, it says you were a member of four uh, World Cup teams. Were you on the team in 2005 that won it all? I was, yep. That was my first one. How old were you then? I was, the team. I was uh, 17 at the time. That's got to be a record for youngest member of a world championship. I remember, like, yeah, Apples Naval Academy. It was, uh, whew, it was hard to believe that was so many years ago. So that probably answers my next question. How does a kid from Adelaide, Australia end up in Chicago? But if you're 17 years old playing and winning a world championship, you probably had a couple people notice you. <laughs> yeah, so that actually, that World Cup came at a perfect time because I had been contacted maybe 
in the six months prior to that by a few different schools. I mean, I grew up wanting to go to Maryland. That was my goal, following in the footsteps of Sarah Forbes, Jen Adams, Sonia Monica, Courtney Hobbs, like a, the pipeline of Aussies have been to Maryland. And then at the time that they were recruiting me, um, it was on Cindy Timshaw's last couple of years. So they started to dip a little bit and uh, Northwestern had just won their first national championship. And um, so I was looking at Maryland, Princeton, North, Northwestern, Loyola, and Denver. And so that World Cup rolled around, and Kelly Amonti was actually playing on the U.S. team, and I was um, playing on the Australian team. Um, so they had already, like, begun to recruit me, and I knew after that World Cup I was taking official visits. You know, obviously being in America uh, was a perfect time for me to take some official visits. But one of the funniest stories um, of, of the World Cup final was – my one job, you know, as a 17 year old, so I, I was basically a role player on, on the Australian team. My one job was to start on the center circle and Kelly took the draws at the time and she was very good at them, just getting them to herself. And so basically the coach said, your one job is you've just like, you're a bull to a red flag and you have to just go in and just take her down. And, uh, I remember I just, the ball would go up and I would just crash in and my one job would just try and be check, check, check. And I actually got a yellow card for hitting her in the head. <laughs> we ended and up she still recruited game, you. you know. Yeah. And two days later, I went on an official visit good. there and I was like, oh my God, this is like, we just beat you. I got a yellow card for hitting you. I was like, this is, this is so nerve wracking. But um, yeah, as it came down, I took all my official visits and, uh, just you know, with, with how Kelly recruited me and what she sold about the program at the time and um, just the direction they were trending. And it was an opportunity to, for, to do something different. So I ended up, you know, taking a leap of faith and, and going to Northwestern. And it kind of turned out to be one of the, you know, best things, best decisions I ever made, I guess. I, I, I love the fact that you just said it was a chance to do something different, as if being a 17-year-old world winning world championships and coming from Australia to the United States to play women's lacrosse didn't make you unique enough. You had to go to Chicago to do it. <laughs> I know, yes. That was, uh, yeah, I don't know. I've always just wanted to do my own thing, so it worked out. Awesome. Yeah, I, I had a quick one, you know, as, as we talk about, you know, really you, you brought up, uh, you know, obviously uh, back when you played, um, and, and I'm, I'm curious as I, as I watch the game and I learn more about the game with my younger daughter, um, can you speak to the, how the game has changed from when you played, you know, maybe in 17, 18, to, to the game that you see today, um, you know, physicality, obviously more athletes. I think that's been kind of the common theme as, as we talk uh, to a lot of the women's coaches. Um, can, can you speak to that? Uh, it's just, it's training drastically, you know, with different just rules that have, uh, you know, the free movement has changed it um, dramatically, made it so much more fan friendly. You know, even just the other day, I was watching the, some footage from the 2017 World Cup and, you know, it's stop on the whistle and it's um, more Shopping. people in the center circle and it's just a totally different game. Uh, you know, college when I played, uh, was it was it was evolving for sure and we were playing at a pretty fast pace but college now it's yeah absolutely more physical uh the stick technology has allowed people to just do some incredible things uh you know stick skills wise um the rule changes have all been for the better it's yeah. faster it's yeah, as i said easy to watch a lot of men's lacrosse players and, and men's lacrosse fans are a little bit more willing to watch women's lacrosse now you know the, the implementation of the shot clock uh you just, you have to be so much fitter. You have to be such a better athlete now. Right. And I just, I think the game is just evolving in, in such a good direction. Um, you know, we, we were skillful and, and great when I played for sure. But I just think some of the athleticism you see now in the game is, is just so fun to watch. So, you know, I mean, you know, previously it was, it was just stick work, right? I mean, stick work was the key thing. And now with the evolution of, of athletes and the training, um, you know, is, is, there, is there a fear of, of loss of that stick work? Um, or do you think that'll just continue alongside with the athletic piece and the training piece? Yeah, I don't think so. I think if, you know, you got an athlete with a great stick, you, you know, it's, it's even better. Um, right. I, stick work's still something we have a focus on uh, and still so, so important. But I think you're just getting, you're getting 
better athletes and you're making them fitter and you're, and you're increasing their stick work. So it's just everything collectively, uh, especially with females, like they're learning how to shoot outside shots. They're learning how to shoot shots and behind the backs and just like, and the sticks are allowing us to do that. Now. So it's yeah. for such better watching. Um, you know, I remember, you know, like to, to a lot of spectators, um, I guess, what would you say, um, disapproval, like when I played in national championships and in final fours, we had the ability to, we were up by two goals with seven minutes to go, all right, I'm just going to stand behind Run the, out. Yep. For the last six minutes of the game and listen to the booze and listen to the, you know, to the noise. But, you know, Kelly was a smart coach and, and why would you do anything else when you're playing within yeah. the rules of the game? And I think yeah. the fact that I changed is just, you know, I worked for me at the time but I, I agree that change needed to be needed to be made and and I think that's such, been such a good good thing for both you know the women and then the men following suit I know was a, a big a good decision for a lot of the, the men's side yeah good um it kind of gets me to a, a follow-up question that I've been asking some people is um is there something in the game whether it's the women's game that, that the men's game could learn from the women's game or, or take it on? Is there something in the women's game that you still think needs work? Um, I mean, the one thing I probably would have said about the men's game was the shot block. They, they followed suit. Um, you know, we always used to say our sticks have less of a pocket, so we're a bit more skillful, but I don't think that's the case. You know, I, I love watching men's lacrosse. I think it's fast. I think women's lacrosse, can still become a little bit more physical, you know, different places you play um, around the country, the East Coast will let you play pretty physical and different refs call it pretty differently, especially as you go more West. Uh, so I, I love the physicality about it. I don't want to see us wear pads and helmets at all, uh, but I, I think they're going to continue to let us play. Um, and I think the one thing the women, you know, I was just saying this to one of my assistants today, um, I'd, I'd just love to see our field shrunk a little bit, length, uh, lengthwise in the women's game you know I like how short the men's field is and how kind of sh quick transition is and I think the, the women's field is so big uh if we could shrink it by you know 10 yards either side I think that's probably one change I'd be in favor for. Yeah. Chris you look like you're waiting to say something or to agree with her oh I totally agree with, with the shorter field I think did the W the WPLL you guys played on the shorter field right yeah exactly yeah I mean if you want I watched a lot of those games I mean that was that was cool. That, that's pushing the game forward immensely. Exactly. So. I like six v six as well. You know, we we still have that extra person in college, so we're playing seven on seven around net. Um, and I I like six v six. Yeah, very cool. So with um the the. Your, your role with the, the women's national team in Australia, uh, you were there on the team in 2017. Are you going to try to play again in 2021? I am. It's my last hurrah, I think. <laughs> One song. Two more times, at One least. Song. Yeah, no. Two more yeah, times. The 2017 was an interesting World Cup. It was one of the most rewarding in the sense I was a captain. You know, I'd always been the youngest since 2005, so I was playing with my idols and just sort of being – I was on the team, but never a captain, and and I was always a you know once 2009 and 2013 hit, I was a key contributor, but still, I wasn't the leader. And then 2017, all those players stopped playing, and I became a captain, and it was a really cool transition for me to be now the oldest player, um, leading and mentoring the younger ones. And you know we were about a minute from making the gold medal game, and uh, you know a couple of dumb decisions, and a couple of overtimes away from from making that game, and then. We were, we, we basically blew an opportunity for a bronze medal as well. And, and so it ended up being a fourth place finish, which was really disappointing. Um, just last week was the first time I was able to watch that, that bronze medal game. And, and uh, so, you know, I'm certainly looking forward to kind of making amends and just kind of going out maybe on a better note. Um, and just, you know, I, I love playing, as I said, if I could be a professional lacrosse player, I would. Um, I'm probably in the, the best shape I've ever been in. You know, I, I thought I was in the best shape last time, but it's just, I don't know. It's like something about your, your early 30s is um, I'm, I know how to train. I feel really fit. Uh, I've got the love for the game and, and uh, the ability to go and, you know, hopefully be a leader of the team again. And, and uh, it's actually where I, so my very first World Cup 
for under 19s was played at Towson and uh, back in 2003 and this World Cup, you know, what will we be? 19, is that, what's, I can't do the math, but however many years later, 2021 is going to be at the same place. So it seems to be a fitting ending point and, and hopefully it will be a um, successful experience as well. Now, Very just cool. think, if one of your Michigan players makes the American roster and they get a chance to get a yellow card hitting you in the head. I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we can come full circle. Exactly. All right. A uh, couple rapid fire questions. Uh, you have friends in town in Ann Arbor. Where are you taking them to, di to dinner for a night? Uh, Aventura. Aventura? Okay. Um, Interesting. Favorite Australian band or musician? Mm. Um, I love Paul Kelly. Okay. My wife is a huge John Butler fan, so I was uh, fingers crossed for John Butler Trio. So am I. Yeah. John Butler's one of my favorite bands of all time. He is phenomenal. He's he played, uh, definitely... Uh, he played a couple years ago. I'm sorry, you broke up. What was that? He played at the uh, at the Michigan Theater on Liberty a couple of years ago. I went. We were there. We also actually went and saw him in Chicago in 2010. Uh, yeah. Some hole in the wall in Ann Arbor. Or I'm sorry, in Chicago. Chicago, so good. I've seen him at Red Rocks. He's yeah, he's a man. Awesome. Sorry, we're, I'm a hippie. I'm gonna ask those music questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. John, I attest. <laughs> thanks, guys. Uh, any follow-up questions from you guys on music or food or, or Australian culture? Favorite lunch spot in Ann Arbor? Oh, um, Morgan and York. Good spot Morgan on, and uh, York. On, uh, on Packard. Yep. Um, or Produce Station is, is a staple right around the corner from the stadium. <laughs> Good salad bar. I haven't. I haven't been to the other place. Interesting. Morgan and York. It's good. It's it's now actually just called York, um, but it's right near Fraser's. That little uh, little pub on um, Packard. I like Fraser's. Yes, right near there. I haven't lived in Ann Arbor in over twenty five years. I don't even know if the places I used to go hang out are still there. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a quick one to wrap up. You know, one of the things we've been trying to do um, on the boys' side is, is um, you know, play some, some high school games up in Ann Arbor. Um, you know, bring, bring together, whether it's, you know, a team from out of state. Uh, I know Catholic Central played um, New Trier up there uh, last year. Any, any thoughts on potentially doing something like that with a couple of Michigan teams and, you know, how I'd, something be it. I'd be, you know, I don't know how we make something like that happen, but I'd be completely on board and, uh, It'd be, yeah, there you go. Well, email. I'll, yeah, I'll, take, I'll take the lead. I think it'd be great. And I know what they do um, in, uh, in, in Chicago is uh, they, they've played like the state championship at Northwestern before. Um, yes, so right. Something that we're trying to do, or, but I'd be, you know, all for it. And I think it's a great showcase of obviously the facility we have and, and be a really cool experience for the girls. Yeah, no question. And, and and that is something hopefully that the Michigan High School Athletic Association will do, um, you know, because, I mean, we had the, the boy, the, 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 you know, the boys and the girls playing the state championships on the same day at different yeah. locations. And awesome. it's like, you know, it just it's makes like no So I am trying to spearhead that as well. Awesome. Well, let me know how I can help. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll definitely contact you. So Hannah, just to kind of, um, you know, bring this back full circle with this being the U S lacrosse Michigan chapter and, and us trying to grow the game here in Michigan and just have some conversations. Uh, we've been talking about putting on a series of, of virtual coaches clinics or, or a chance for high school Michigan coaches to tune in and say, okay, show me your ride. You're clear. you whatever it is. is. Is there a topic that you would be like, Ooh, uh, I want to teach this course because I really enjoy it. Or, or if we were going to do this, would we be able to volunteer you into to hosting one of these? I'd love to. I mean, it's, look, especially especially this summer, um, when if, if I don't have anything else to do, uh, <laughs> with a lot of time on my hands, it's something that I've definitely already kind of thought about um, and certainly happy to help. You know, I think, you know, naturally being an offensive player, you know, I would – 
offensive concepts or offensive skill development or just kind of fundamental drills to build an offense, things like that um, would be an area of focus, but I'd be happy to do anything and everything um, awesome. to help out something like that. And again, as long as the compliance gives me the all okay, then I'd be, be happy to help and, and my staff as well. You know, would be great. Thrilled. That's great. You know, with, with U.S. lacrosse. Go ahead, Colin. Skill development is going to be very critical in the state. I've done, uh, you know, uh, I helped uh, train Izzy when she was in high school and all those Cranberg girls. Um, and, you know, there's there obviously is not that much uh, skill development going on. Uh, and, and I think uh, if we could build a kind of a, a – a, a progressive plan that you could give a bunch of girls in the state, it would help immensely. Because uh, you know, I only have twelve or fifteen at a time, and yeah. uh, you know, I'm doing some pretty basic stuff, and they're like, "Wow, we don't do anything like this." So, right, if we could get something out like that, Chris, I think it would be really helpful for the entire state. Yeah, and that's been the common theme. I mean, you know, every time we've we've you know the topic of, of women's lacrosse, we talked about Michigan. It's been you know really that that stark difference in the skill set, especially within the state. When you look at the west side of the state with Rockford and East Grand Rapids. In comparison, down here in the southeastern Michigan as well, there's just a, a, a big difference uh, in the skill sets. Yeah, well, I mean, you, know, East, um, you know, for us, as long as we're allowed to get back and get on our field, that's something that me and you know my fellow offensive coach would just love to start. You know, as we're not doing much again, as I said, if we can't recruit, um, you know, we may as well be out there shooting videos and uh, you know for our own kids as well as for something like this. Uh, to be able to put out coaches clinics or you know even stuff for players yeah get creative and uh, exactly. utilize technology and figure it out yeah that's very cool yeah. it's something we've never done before at least as far as i know as far as the michigan chapter we, we definitely have done coaches clinics coaches development programs and certifications but we've never said here's here's a, a member of our community let's put them online for a webinar and ask questions um right. but between you yeah. you know marianne Meltzer winning you know offensive player of the year while at maryland and all of her accolades you know she said she'd get involved it's just we, we want to grow the game we, we want people to know that their membership in u.s lacrosse isn't just a magazine and insurance and a chance to, to support the national teams that that we care and there's sticks pro, you know grant programs and, and first stick programs and, and officials training and everything else um and even though you're uh, an expat uh, i don't even know that's the right term but you're not a, uh, an american citizen uh, sure, yep. you're part of the michigan lacrosse are you, are you, a, dual? Are you a dual citizen uh, no, I'm not. I'm on a visa, so I'm still still an Aussie citizen. <laughs> say that. Say that way. Yes, that's. that's You're way cooler point. than us. Yep. I, I'm saying not U.S. versus Australia. You live in Michigan. You're a part of the Michigan lacrosse scene, so we're yeah, we're bringing you on board. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to help. Happy to help. It's a melting pot of lacrosse. Yes. All right, Hannah. Party. Can I ask the final question? Can I ask the final question? Go, Go on. for it. It's a little. It's a little long. Uh, can you give us a stat? You said you're in the best shape of your life. Can you give us the best? Can you give us kind of a little snapshot of your training regimen uh, that you're doing that maybe some yeah, people well, can kind of take a, a glance you know, at? I've had to, had to improvise over the last six or seven weeks, but um, it's it consists of yoga, spinning, weights, and running. Uh, currently in quarantine, it's it's yoga three times a week and some sort of interval running three times a week and um, some circuits uh, as what I'm doing now. But when I was back in, back in Michigan, I wasn't running a ton. I was just doing just lifting and, and spinning, but it's actually quarantine has been great to get back on my feet and, and to start doing, you know, intervals the, the Peloton app uh, has been really good for just for running, running intervals and um, yeah, doing what I can, but I'm looking forward to getting back in the gym. That's for sure. Yeah. Are yeah, you spinning I, a uh, cycle bar? Are you cycle uh, bar? I've got one of those Peloton bikes. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'll have you know, I've worked out two days in a row now, and I've only gotten 17 Legos embedded in my feet because it's in the basement oh, where my oh, kids man. have all their play toys. Uh, but we've gotten up at 6 a.m., my wife and I, and, and 
tomorrow's day three. Um, I think I've had 17 yeah. taquito, I think I've had 17 taquitos in the last two days. So I have yeah. a very similar thing. If you're going to yeah. go for it, break records, man. Be the best. That's right. Anna, I really appreciate your time on short notice on quarantine and everything. Uh, I have your awesome. email. I will reach out to you if we get this coaches clinic thing going. Um, uh, for those still listening, go join US Lacrosse at uslacrosse.org forward slash join. Uh, he's at Lax Losi on Twitter. He's at Chris Cullen on Twitter. Hannah, you are? Uh, at Hannah Nielsen 7. Hannah Nielsen 7 on Twitter. We will tag you when we tweet this out. We will tag Michigan lacrosse. We will tag Australian lacrosse and see if they'll retweet it too. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I, I really oh, yeah. appreciate your, your knowledge, your skills, making time mm -hmm. for us, and, and all that kind of good stuff. So stay safe and uh, good yeah. luck. Guys, I need to you guys too. Wonderful yeah, to meet you. Man. All right.